Muy buenas tardes a todos y bienvenidos a una nueva sesión del ciclo La Biología en los Medios. Como habéis podido ver en el material a través del cual hemos hecho la publicidad de esta charla, vamos a realizarla en inglés, vamos a realizar toda la actividad en inglés. Así que voy a cambiar de idioma a partir de este momento. Welcome everyone to this new session of the cycle biology in the media that we organize at the School of Biology at Complutense University. Our goal, as uh, most of you know, with this seminar series is to get a deeper understanding on those news related to biology that have a big impact on mass media, on non-specialized media. We want to provide more information on those news with rigor and a little more detail than the one that is given in newspapers or in the news. Today's talk is about a piece of news that made it to mass media at the end of last year regarding a discovery related to an old dogma in neurobiology that stated that no neurons are produced in the adult brain. We have known for years that that idea was not accurate and that there are in fact specific areas in our adult brains capable of generating new neurons. What we didn't know until now was the origin of those cells and their involvement in neurological diseases or the other way around, the effect of those diseases on this cell population. The answers to these questions were provided by our speaker in a research paper published last October in the journal Science. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce Maria Llorenz Martin, the main responsible for that work. Maria studied biology in our school and did her PhD at the Cajal Institute, where she started working on adult hippocampal neurogenesis. She continued her research in this field in Jesus Avila's lab at the Center of Molecular Biology, Severo Ochoa, as a postdoctoral fellow. And then she moved to Japan for a few months to the University of, of Tsukuba with a very prestigious Japanese postdoctoral fellowship for foreign researchers. In 2016, she returned to Spain to the CBM, where she currently holds a tenure position as Científico Titular. It was then, and I repeat, 2016, just five years ago, when she set up her independent lab, which focuses on the study of the basic biology and neuroprotective potential of adult uh, hippocampal neurogenesis for the treatment of various diseases. Since the establishment of her own group, she has been the principal investigator of several national and international research grants an ERC consolidator grant, just to mention one, and have published 27 papers in high impact journals, such as Science, Nature Medicine, Nature Protocols, and, and others. She has received uh, three national research awards, the Cibernet Young Investiga Investigator Award in 2014, Miguel Catalan Young Investigator Award in 2019, and Young Female Talent Award of the Spanish Royal Academy of Sciences in 2019. And she's a full member of the Spanish Young Academy. As you can see, it's pretty obvious that we have an exceptional guest with us today. And before passing the torch to her, let me tell you all that this talk is very special for us, not only because of Maria's high profile and because she studied here, but also because this is not the first time that we invite her. Uh, roughly two years ago, Maria published another paper confirming the existence of adult hippocampal neurogenesis that also had huge impact in the media. We invited her then to give a talk that was actually scheduled for May 2020, but we had to cancel because uh, we were immersed in the worst peak of the pandemic. So having Maria here today is not only an honor for us, but also a sign that we are somehow and slowly going back to, to normal. So now, and without any further ado, welcome to your home, Maria, and, and thank you for accepting our invitation, not once, but twice. So whenever you want. Thank you, Cristina. It's a, a big pleasure and a, and a big honor for me to be, to be here, to be, as you said, at my home. I feel the, the Universidad Complutense de Madrid like my home where I started my scientific journey in some way. So as I said, it's, it's a pleasure. It was a pleasure to accept your invitation two years ago, and, and it is now. 
So as Cristina said today, I would like to talk about an extraordinary phenomenon that occurs in the mammalian brain, which is adult neurogenesis. And I would like to start specifically by defining what adult neurogenesis means and what does this phenomenon involve. The incorporation of new neurons is an extraordinary phenomenon of plasticity, given that the generation of new functional neurons implicates that the existing circuitry needs to be remodeled each time that a new neuron is incorporated. So as you can imagine, adult neurogenesis does not occur in widespread in our brain, but in very specific regions of the brain named neurogenic niches. Some of these regions have been studied for the last decades in rodents, and I want to show you here the two ones that now everybody acknowledges to be neurogenic, to, to hold this neurogenic potential in the rodent brain. One of them is the, the walls of the lateral ventricles, where neural progenitors divide and give rise to, to transiently to, to migrate in neuroblasts. Which, uh, who go, which go through the rostral migratory stream and migrate towards the olfactory ball, but they integrate into, into this circuit. The other neurogenic niche is the subgranular zone of the hippocampus, and which is the region on most of the work from my lab is focused on. Here you can see a representation of the general anatomy of the hippocampus, both in humans and in mice. As you can see, there are similarities, but also the structure, the whole structure of, of this part of the brain is slightly different. Anyway, we can perfectly identify this layer, this dental gyrus, which is formed by the presence of dental granule cells, granule neurons. And this other region named Cornu ammonis, which is subdivided into different fields named CA1, CA2, CA3, and CA4. The main difference, or one of the main differences between these two areas, is that the dental gyrus holds the capacity to generate new neurons, whereas the CA fields are not neurogenic. The hippocampus is involved in learning and memory and is uh, also a, a key node of uh, emotional regulation. Moreover, the hippocampus is the target of several neurodegenerative diseases and is affected in psychiatric disorders. As you can imagine, the addition of new neurons in this structure plays a key role since it participates in each of the functions in which the hippocampus is involved. In this general scheme, I want to show you a representation of what the process of adult neurogenesis looks like. Here we have made a composition of several images showing the presence of a very special uh, cellular type, which is the neural stem cell type, which is the origin of the process of adult neurogenesis. These cells hold the capacity to generate new neurons uh, through asymmetric cell division. The daughter cells, which are the transit amplifying progenitors, go through different to, to various uh, differentiation stages that transform these cells both from the morphological and the functional points of view. And finally, after the cells have completed their maturation process, newly generated neurons are integrated into the hippocampal circuitry. The way in which this process, this process of adult hippocampal neurogenesis has been studied is based on the use of specific cell markers, which are molecules that are expressed during um, during a limited periods of time and allow us to identify specific stages of this process. Here, this is a, just a very simple scheme of uh, the be better known molecules that are expressed during each of these stages. As you can see, the process is really complex. I don't want to, to get too much into detail. But as you can see, some of these markers are expressed during long periods of time, whereas other cells are expressed during shorter periods of time. So by combining these markers, we can know at which, at which stage is one uh, individual cell. Another feature that is very important in this process is the presence of these uh, accompanying cells which 
form the so-called neurogenic niche. This structure is formed by astrocytes, microglia, blood vessels, interneurons, and other variety of cells, which give the trophic support to the newly generated neurons for them to mature and integrate. Moreover, another key strategy that has been used to study adult neurogenesis is uh, the birth dating of new cells. It was necessary for adult neurogenesis to be demonstrated to act actually occur to be able to label the cells at the moment in which they were generated. So by using these methods, no one questioned uh, the fact that adult neurogenesis was a robust phenomenon in the rodent brain. However, due to technical and ethical difficulties, the study of this process was a bit more complicated in the human brain. So the question uh, of whether adult neurogenesis takes place and to what extent this process is robust in the adult human brain was an important focus of controversy in the last years. Here, uh, I represented in green color all the papers that supported the occurrence of adult neurogenesis in the human brain, but also in red color three key papers that uh, showed the absence of markers of adult neurogenesis in the adult human dental gyrus. The problem here was that by using uh, very similar methodologies, different labs came to opposite conclusions. So we wondered whether methodological differences, even though they might be very subtle, could underlay the discrepancies between the results obtained from different labs. In order to ask, answer this question, which looks very trivial, but it's not at all, one has to, to have a clear idea of the so many stages that uh, a human sample has to go through before being observed in the microscope. So as you can see here, this process, as I said, is complex and there are many choices that, um, that make uh, the different pathways non-compatible. So we couldn't study the effect of all the slight modifications in these steps, but we focused our attention on the fixation process, which is the immersion of the brain samples in a fixative solution, which generally is made of distinct aldehydes, paraformaldehyde, formalin, etc., and which in our hand was critical to study several components of the adult neurogenesis process in rodents. So we wondered whether fixation could in influence our capacity to detect markers of adult neurogenesis in the human brain. To answer this question in an initial study, what we did was to obtain the whole hippocampus from several subjects and divide this hippocampi into small fragments. And each of these fragments was fixed for a different period of time in a freshly prepared solution of uh, paraformaldehyde. So what we did was something very simple. We wanted to compare the number of double coating positive cells, the number of immature neurons that we were able to, to detect in samples obtained from the same subject, but that have been fixed for different periods of time. As you can see here, when we fixed the samples for short periods of time, only 12 hours, and, and why do I say these are short uh, times of fixation? Well, the standard protocol that is followed at the brain banks worldwide is to fix the sample for several months or even years informally. So these are extremely short uh, fixation times that were um, that matched what we did with the, the mouse samples in the lab. So here you can see in red color the presence of an abundant population of immature neurons in the dental gyrus. But surprisingly, when we fixed the samples obtained from the same subjects for 12 more hours, so 24 hours in total, the beautiful signal obtained with this anti-double protein antibody completely disappeared and was replaced by this unspecific background signal that impeded identification of positive cells. So we started to work very hard to figure out what was happening there and finally identified a combination of histological treatments that we have to, to subject the tissue to um, that 
removed this excessive fixation of, of the of produced by the aldehydes present in the in the fixative solution. So by using this simple protocol, we uh, reverted these negative consequences of the fixative and were able to visualize not only these immature neurons, but also some morphological characteristics of these cells. So the conclusion of these two works by our lab is the fact that depending on how we treat the human tissue, we can conclude that adult neurogenesis is present or not. But the true can only be one. So the fact was that if we fixed for longer periods of time the samples that allow visualization of markers of immature neurons, that signal completely disappeared. So this was our first conclusion that fixation is a critical factor that should be taken into account when working with uh, the adult human brain to study adult neurogenesis. But another important factor was the specificity of the signal that we obtained. So it was very important to demonstrate that in those places uh, of, the, of the hippocampus that are not known or uh, that are known not to generate new neurons, such as the CA1, CA2, CA3 fields, there was no presence of double coating positive neurons, as you can see here. But in contrast, when we analyzed specifically the dental gyrus, the neurogenic zone of the hippocampus, we uh, observed this robust presence of immature neurons. Although the numbers of these neurons uh, showed some variations between the subjects. And this is something that we were very curious about. Also, it was very important to demonstrate that the morphology of the cells that we were observing with these antibodies was that one that is classical for the uh, granule neuron. So we were not detecting with our staining protocol other cells, or we were not detecting double coating expression in other cell types, which would make no sense at all. So double coating is not expressed in astrocytes, in microglial cells, or in blood vessels. So as I mentioned, we found this variability in the number of immature neurons, and which were the factors that could account for this uh, variability. The first one was the postmortem delay, which is the time elapsed between uh, the person dies and the sample is extracted and immersed in fixative. During this period of time, as you can imagine, most enzymes are working and are degrading proteins. So most of our samples have short postmortem delays in green color, but we also had some uh, samples with longer postmortem delays. In this case, we did not find a, a, a reduction in the number of immature neurons that we detected with, the, with longer postmortem delays. We also did not find any uh, change in the number of double protein positive cells, uh, depending on the gender of the subject. But in contrast, when we represented the number of cells and the age of the subjects, we found this phenomenon, which is the reduction of the rate of adult neurogenesis uh, during aging, which also served as a validation of our results, given that this reduction has been described in numerous mammalian species. And Something that called very powerfully our attention was the fact that not all the double coating positive neurons appear to be the same. They show different location in the granule cell layer, different presence of a different number of neurites and orientation of the same, and also the soma size of these cells appear to, to, to be different. So the only way we could um, check if this Seem to seem to seem to mean something was to colocalize uh, the expression of double coating, which identifies these cells as immature neurons, with other markers that are specific for shorter periods of time during uh, the maturation of the neurons. In this way, we aim at comparing whether cells very very immature were different from other cells that uh, were at more advanced stages of maturation. As you can see here, most of the double coating positive cells were positive for the specific marker for granule neurons named PROX1. 
but importantly, a small population of, well, not that small population of double coating positive cells was positive for markers of proliferation, which indicated that these cells hold proliferative capacity as they did in rodents. And this percentage of cells which hold the capacity to proliferate is maintained through aging. Other cells, in this case, a small percentage of cells, express markers of indifferentiated neurons or named neuroblasts, whereas other cells express markers of intermediate stages of maturation. And how can we affirm that these cells are at intermediate stages of maturation? Well, we repeated something that had been done in mice, uh, which was to compare the intensity of uh, the expression of other markers, such as mu n, in cells that were positive for double coating and in cells that were negative, which were the, mature, the fully mature neurons. As you can see here, double coating positive cells did express mu n, but a lower uh, rate compared to fully mature neurons which indicated that they were somehow an, at an intermediate stage of maturation. And finally, other double coating positive cells expressed markers characteristic of more uh, differentiated neurons. So what we did was to compare the two cells that were at the extremes of this maturation process and to see if the morphology of these cells was also representative of their maturation state. As you can see here, the most immature cells, those that express carretinin, were horizontal, small, and had the presence of several apical neurites. But in contrast, the cells that are positive for calvindin look much more mature, bigger, and with the presence of one single primary apical neurite, which is characteristic of mature uh, granin neurons. However, something that was somehow criticized about our previous work published in um, 2019 was that we were not able to detect um, neural stem cells in our tissue. And it was true that at that time when we attempted staining with markers of neural stem cells, such as nesting, we did not observe any convincing staining. But what happened at that time, we were using a standard immunostochemistry protocol with the modifications I mentioned before, but the key point was that we were using some uh, this molecule, this Triton X100, which is a uh, strong detergent. We have very recently been aware that we have to su substitute Triton X100 by saponin, which is a milder detergent, and which allows visualization of several markers of neural stem cells in the adult human tissue. By using this modified or improved protocol, protocol version 2.0, we can observe cells that are positive for nesting, SOX2, dementin, dementin, or DFAP, which are all of them markers of astrocyte um, like uh, radial glia like cells. So these stem cells are known to share several features with astrocytes in the adult brain. And some of these features include the expression of some markers of astrocytes. So this raised the question of whether these cells were actually neural stem cells, which of course can only be uh, completely uh, checked when these cells are uh, plated in vitro uh, to see whether they are actually pluripotent. pluripotent. But speaking in immunostochemical terms, all these markers could be expressed also by astrocytes. So in fact, we also detected some nesting positive cells which were positive for S100 beta, which is an universal marker of astrocytes. But what was most important was that we were able to identify a population of nesting positive S100 beta negative cells, which indicates that these cells are not astrocytes and share phenotypic and morphological properties with the neural stem cells that we know from rodents and other mammalian species. For example, these cells have these long uh, processes which transfers the granule cell layer. Um, and moreover, 99% of these cells are located at the subgranular zone, which 
neural stem cells in mammals are known to, to be located. So these characteristics uh, spoke about the population of nesting positive S100 beta negative radial glial -like cells with shared phenotypic characteristics with uh, mammalian neural stem cells. Moreover, it was important also to detect that these cells were able to proliferate. So we studied markers of proliferation in order to reconstruct the whole process of adult neurogenesis in the human brain. We detected markers of proliferation, mitosis, and proliferative neuroblasts in the human dental gyrus. But to what extent were these cells reflecting proliferation of neuroblasts or cells committed to the neuronal lineage? Well, we quantified um, different parameters and determined that 90% or 80% of um, HUC, HUD positive neuroblasts were double coating positive and were also located at the subgranular zone, which indicated that phenotypically these proliferative cells were committed to the neuronal lineage in the human dental gyrus. So this reconstruction uh, was talking about the dynamic process represented by adult neurogenesis also in humans, as in many other mammalian species. We detected immature neurons, neural stem cells, or cells with characteristics of neural stem cells, and also proliferative cells in the dental gyrus. So together with all the previous evidences represented in green color in my original table, supported the notion that adult neurogenesis is a robust phenomenon in the human dental gyrus until the ninth decade of life. But all this so far is about uh, physiological conditions. Let's say that these subjects that we studied until this point were all neurologically healthy. So what, um, well, what happened uh, specifically with the other components of the, of the, of the adult neurogenesis process? Um, if you remember, we talked about the presence of astrocytes, microglia, and vascular elements. And the functioning of all these elements is crucial for adult neurogenesis to not only to exist, but also to, to be adapted to the external conditions of the, of the subject. In particular, we know from Roden's work that the interaction between adult neurogenesis and microglial cells is crucial for these cells to survive. Here you can see in green color microglial cells, which are approaching to this uh, pignotic nucleus uh, from an apoptotic cell and are attempting engulfing or phagocyting this nucleus. In fact, we know that 35% of uh, apoptotic cells in the dental gyrus are being phagocytosed by microglia. And this interaction between these two types of cells seem to be important, given that the morphology of microglial cell changes depending on the presence of these phagocytic pouches, which are the structures that these cells use to phagocytose uh, these functional cells. We know that the lower the number of microglial phagocytic pouches, the higher the number of cells, of the apoptotic cells that remain to be phagocytosed. So the better the microglial cells work, the better the adult neurogenesis process also seemed to work. And it was important given that even though the number of microglial cells was not modified during aging, the capacity of these cells to, to phagocytose apoptotic neurons was decreased. So we wondered whether this decrease in the phagocytic capacity of microglia that we observed in neurologically healthy subjects could also be related to, to some dysfunction of the whole hippocampal dental gyrus in patients with neurodegenerative diseases. So, at first time in 2019, we started studying maybe the most obvious neurodegenerative disease that attacks or that targets the hippocampus, which is Alzheimer's disease. We started uh, characterizing this, 45, this cohort of 45 uh, patients with Alzheimer's disease that were at distinct stages of severity of the disorder. I forgot to mention that all this work, both 
this in, in neurologically healthy subjects that I mentioned before, and all the work with patients uh, with neurodegenerative diseases has been done in collaboration with Dr. Alberto Raban at the Fundación Cien here in Madrid. And we are very proud of this collaboration and the, the high quality samples we obtain um, in collaboration with the Brain Bank. So by using this collection of samples, which were processed in the same way that the, those from neurologically healthy subjects, we could determine that the number of immature neurons, as you can see here, was progressively reduced during the advance of the disease. But what is most remarkable is the fact that even at fractal stage one, which is the first severity stage of the disease in which most of the patients do not present uh, clinical symptoms, the rate of adult neurogenesis, or at least the presence of immature neurons, was reduced by a 33% uh, as compared to controls. Moreover, the number of immature neurons was further reduced when, when the disease continues its progress. This reduction is specific of immature neurons, given that uh, the number of total mature neurons remain uh, unchanged. However, these cells that were putatively being generated in the dental gyrus expressed with less frequency markers that indicated that they were correctly advancing in their maturation process. It means that adult neurogenesis can be targeted by, adult, by uh, Alzheimer's disease at multiple levels, and one of these levels could be the final maturation of these cells. So as a conclusion, adult neurogenesis was altered in patients with Alzheimer's disease, but somehow this was not surprising, as I said, given that the hippocampus is one of the main targets of this disease. But we were also interested in studying whether other diseases that do not target, at least in a direct form, the hippocampus could also affect adult neurogenesis in humans. Um, some of the diseases that we studied uh, recently in our 2021 paper, where um, these patients suffered uh, ALS, for example, which is a, a motor neuron disease that targets a very distant part uh, of the brain or the spinal cord even. Huntington's disease in which the basal ganglia are degenerated, as you can see here, the enlargement of the lateral ventricles. Parkinson's disease, in which the substantia nigra and the basal ganglia are uh, degenerated with the, this loss of tyroxine hydroxylase positive neurons. And then we studied other two diseases that were more um, sparse, if you want. So they are not focused on a single region of the brain, but um, are characterized by dispersed neurodegeneration in different brain areas. These two diseases are dementia with Lewy bodies, with, which also shares some similarities with Parkinson's disease from the, um, both the clinical and the neuropathological points of view, although there are relevant differences between these diseases, and frontotemporal dementia, which is characterized by a general alteration in movement and, and also um, <clears throat> and also uh, behavior and cognitive capacities. So these were the initial uh, number of diseases that we studied. We started to study several years ago, but now we are increasing our scope and, and studying also uh, psychiatric diseases in our lab. So I would like um, to, to, to summary in a simple way the so complex data that we obtained we, when we studied these diseases. And to do that, I think that following this scheme will be uh, somehow useful. So we can start by defining what happens with the population of neural stem cells in these diseases. As a general markers of neural stem cells, we use nesting and SOX2. But we also determine the, percentage, the, the number of these cells that did not express S100 beta. So we quantified specifically the neural stem cells, uh, properly speaking. 
So in patients with ALS, we found an increase in both the number of nesting positive S100 beta negative and SOX2 positive cells, which reflected the fact that the population of neural stem cells was increased in patients with this disease. So one could think that this is something beneficial, but increasing the number of neural stem cells is something very dangerous in adult mammals because this expansion of the population is usually related to an exhaustion of the, of the neurogenic capacity of these neural stem cells. In patients with Huntington's disease, we also found an increase in the number of nesting positive S100 beta negative cells, uh, which also uh, <clears throat> reflected this possible uh, increase in the number of neural stem cells, which was also replicated in patients with Parkinson's disease. So look, these three diseases, which do not target the hippocampus directly, are positively altering the neurogenic capacity of the neural stem cells that are in this structure. In contrast, patients with uh, dementia with Lewy body disease uh, um, and frontotemporal dementia did not experience changes in the number of neural stem cells. So what happens with proliferation? One would expect that the levels of proliferation were also changed in parallel to those of the, of the neural stem cells. Is this what is really happening? In this case, we used two, two classical markers of proliferation. And you can see how surprised we, be, we were when detected that the number of proliferative cells was not modified in patients with ALS, Huntington's disease, but in this case, they were increased in patients with Parkinson's. So similarly, we did not detect changes in patients with dementia with Lewy body diseases, with Lewy bodies, but a reduction in the number of proliferative cells in a patient with frontotemporal dementia. So this scenario is starting to draw uh, a disbalance between the number of radial glia-like cells that are present in these diseases and the amount of proliferation. So how can this be explained? We don't have an answer for that question and it's a very complex problem to solve, but it could perfectly be that the number of radial glia-like cells is increased because these cells are somehow after being increased, remaining in a quiescent state or because they cannot complete their proliferation cycle. So the fact is that adult neurogenesis is not always regulated in a parallel way in all the multiple stages. And this is something that we know from Rodens and also some reports uh, point to this same phenomenon in humans. So accompanying this disbalance, uh, initial stages of the process, what happened with the, what happened with the immature neurons uh, labeled with double coating? Well, in this case, in several of these diseases, we again find an increase in the number of immature neurons, but other diseases do not uh, show this tendency. Does this mean that the number of neurons that are being generated is increased? So keep please this question in mind and I will try to, to give an answer later. Because if this number of cells that are being generated were constant, the size of the dental gyrus of these patients should also be progressively increased. Is this the case, do you think? Obviously not. So the point is that most of these newly generated neurons or immature neurons also exhibited altered morphology. As you can see here, we found alterations in the number of neurites or in the orientation of these neurites, which so somehow speaks about problems in the maturation process of these cells, which are similar to those that we observed in patients with Alzheimer's disease. So, in most of these diseases, we found a remarkable alteration of the morphology or positioning of these cells. So the process of adult neurogenesis could seem to be increased, but the fact 
is that when we quantify the number of apoptotic cells, the cells that are actually dying in the dentite gyrus, it is they, this number is increased in all the diseases. So despite we may have increased number of radial glia-like cells or immature neurons, probably we are never going to observe an increase in the number of um, total uh, mature neurons. And that's uh, in fact what we observe. So the cells are being generated, but because they cannot mature, probably they die. What happens in addition? The neurogenic niche, which is composed by microglia, astrocytes, and blood vessels, could not be functioning correctly. And that is the case, in fact. The phagocytic capacity of the microglial cells, the capacity of these cells to remove those cells that are being that are dying uh, through apoptosis is decreased. So we have more immature neurons, more apoptotic cells, but the microglia cannot uh, read of them. The number of astrocytes, probably as a consequence of these impairments in the phagocytic capacity of the microglia, are more present in the dental gyrus of these patients. And also, we observe changes in the thickness of the capillaries which could be also indicating inflammatory processes that are taking place in, in their dental jars. And this is something perfectly compatible with the neural degeneration that is occurring in distal brain areas uh, of these patients. So in general, we can say that the homeostasis of the, of the dental jars niche is impaired in patients with neurodegenerative diseases. So as an attempt to somehow uh, order uh, in our mind or in the reader's mind uh, the alterations in the distinct stages of, of the disease, of the, of the process that is observed in patients with different neurodegenerative diseases, we made this model in which the color the, of the arrows represent the disease in which these populations are altered, either increased or decreased. So the conclusion is not whether in ALS this step in particular is increased or not, but in contrast, the fact that in all these diseases, apoptosis is increased, which reflects a malfunctioning of the dental gyrus neurogenic niche components, uh, given astrocytes, uh, microglia, or blood vessels. And this affects the behavior, the proliferative behavior of neural precursors and neural stem cells, which in term, which indeed uh, leads to impairments in the differentiation of dentate cranial cells. So in the future, um, well, in the future we will do many things, but by now uh, we can conclude the presence of cells with phenotypic and morphological characteristics of neural stem cells, proliferative cells, and immature neurons in the human dental gyrus. We can also conclude the existence of a similar structure that, uh, than, than that described in Rodents, which is the dental gyrus neurogenic niche. That neurodegenerative disease is impaired adult neurogenesis and the homeostasis of this niche. And as I said in the future, with the support of the CRC Consolidator Grant in our lab, we want to, to unveil which are the molecular and the cellular mechanisms that control adult neurogenesis, not only during physiological aging, but also in different neurodegenerative conditions. And just to conclude, I would like to, to introduce you the most important part of this talk, which is uh, the group who made this work. Uh, as Cristina said, we are at the CDM in Madrid, and, <clears throat> and uh, we are always willing to accept new students and postdocs uh, whenever it's possible due to space limitations in our lab. I would like to thank all our collaborators who made this work possible, our sponsors, and of course, thank you very much for your attention. And now I will be happy to, to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Maria. 
It was a fascinating talk. What a what an interesting topic and what a fascinating uh, line of research. And congratulations, not only on this last paper, but on the whole career that you have established for yourself and your research group. Congratulations. You, I'm gonna ask you to stop sharing so that any everybody can see your face, like okay. big screen. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> And I'm gonna start asking you the questions that the audience is asking. And I'm gonna remind the audience first that they can ask the questions through the tool that it's in the bottom part of the screens. Preguntas y respuestas, you can type your questions there and I will read them to, to Maria. And we have already two questions from one of our dear professors here at the School of Biology, Agustin Zapata. I'm sure you know him. Mm -hmm. And the first one, is why there are two adult neural niches and how are the mutual relationships between them if they exist? Yeah, thank you, Agustin. Happy to say hello to you. Um, um, I think no one knows why there are only two neurogenic niches. Um, in fact, I have to say that some researchers affirm that there are additional neurogenic niches such as the hypothalamus, for example. But I, I would say that these ones are the most studied uh, ones. Mm. Why are they the most studied ones? I would say that the hippocampus, because it's involved in many behaviors and in many diseases that affect humans, and probably the, the, the subventricular zone niche, because it's very prominent when you use BRDU or proliferation markers and observe the, the whole mouse brain, the proliferation is much more abundant, I would say, in the, in the subventricular zone than in the subgranular zone. So I think that's the, the maybe the reason of why these are the two most studied niches. And regarding their relationships, um, they respond similar to several stimuli but they are regulated independently by many other uh, external factors. For example, it's known that physical exercise specifically, specifically increased adult neurogenesis in the dental gyrus, but not in the ventricular subventricular zone. But other factors such as inflammation can affect the behavior of neural stem cells in both neurogenic niches. Um, it has also been demonstrated that uh, abolishing the neurogenesis in one of these niches does not abolish neurogenesis, neurogenesis in the other one. So it seems that, of course, they are mutually um, related, but also that they are regulated in some other ways in a totally independent manner. Thank you, Maria. And I'm going to go back to his first question. And you mentioned that these are the most studied uh, niches. But do you think that the improvement in histological techniques, which was one of the grounds of your papers, do you think that that improvement could lead to the discovery of new areas, for example? Or Yeah, what I would say is that the lack of evidence for adult neurogenesis in other regions is not a proof for the absence of neurogenesis. I think we should apply the same dogma that has been being discussed for the dental gyrus for several decades now to other regions. So honestly, I don't see much neurogenesis in rodents in other brain areas, but I would never say that that means there is no neurogenesis in those areas because I consider that there are many groups uh, doing very thorough studies of those regions, and, and probably there are some indicators of neurogenesis in, in other regions, such as the hypothalamus. Um, why not? I think it's important to improve the protocols, but in parallel, it's also important to improve the controls. Um, Agustin has another question for you, and it has to do with the relationship between microbiota and central nervous system. And he is asking how the central nervous system feels the changes in microbiota. Well, there are very, very nice studies on, on very funny uh, conclusions about the, the alterations in microbiota and how do they influence adult neurogenesis. 
I think it's now clear for the field that microbiota influences adult neurogenesis and that factors, external factors such as adult, adult ex, uh, physical exercise uh, influences microbiota and through that pathway, it influences adult neurogenesis. But I think that we still don't have a map of the most beneficial bacteria and the most detrimental ones specifically for adult neurogenesis. We have some clues for neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration and even, even for emotional aspects of the behavior, but it's not been yet so well characterized how, they, how it influences uh, adult neurogenesis. And, and related to that, and I'm gonna skip the line of the questions, I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, which are the main stimuli that uh, trigger adult neurogenesis, do you know? And related to this and your answer, your potential answer, how, how do you envision modulating that in order to potentially treat neurodegenerative diseases in the future? Well, the, the best studied ones or the most powerful ones in rodents are physical exercise, cognitive stimulation, and social interaction. So it was demonstrated in 1997 that the combination of these three stimuli applied in, in what we name we call en, en, enriched environment uh, was one of the most powerful um, stimuli that potentiates adult neurogenesis. It has been demonstrated later uh, in, the, in the history that individually each of these factors can trigger neurogenesis. Our group, for example, demonstrated that increasing social interaction alone in the absence of higher physical uh, activity or cognitive stimulation increases the maturation of new neurons. So I would say that those are very powerful stimulators. Learning is also a, a, a good way to, to increase adult neurogenesis, spatial navigation in particular in rodents. And also there are many well-known negative regulators of adult neurogenesis. For example, stress, sleep deprivation, diet, can influence both in a positive and in a negative way the rate of adult neurogenesis, um, hormones, uh, estrous cycle, maternity. So there are many, many, many factors. And regarding your second question, I think that one of them, we have two problems, two maybe two big problems re related to neurodegenerative diseases. One is that we don't know the etiology of these diseases, so we don't know what is malfunctioning several decades before the appearance of these of these disease, of the clinical symptoms symptoms of these diseases. So that makes things a bit complicated. And the second problem we have is that we apply generally all the interventions after the clinical symptoms have appeared. So I wouldn't dare <laughs> to say that increasing adult neurogenesis is going to, to cure any neurodegenerative diseases, especially these diseases that do not target the hippocampus. We are not going to cure Parkinson alone with stimulating adult neurogenesis because there are other neurons that are lying in other parts of the brain. However, what we know from rodents is that maybe if we could prevent the loss of new neurons in the hippocampus, we could ameliorate or, or delay some of the symptoms of these diseases, some secondary symptoms of these diseases. But I think neurodegenerative diseases are so terrible for the whole brain. There are so many things that are not working well that probably reversing only adult neurogenesis wouldn't be sufficient. Even though we started very early, we would need to treat the disease in a more direct way. Thank you so much for your answer. We have another question from Maria Gomez, our colleague from the School of Medicine. I think you know her too. Mm -hmm. And she's asking you if you think that an increase in the central nervous system or an increase in the adult neurogenesis rate in general would be beneficial or detrimental. And if that would depend, for example, on, on the disease itself. Well, that's a, a very interesting question. And in fact, we, we know some conditions in which 
increase in adult neurogenesis worsens the course of the disease. For example, in the case of epilepsy, we know that having more immature neurons is um, amplifying the consequences of seizures. So I think it, of course, depends on what are the neuropathological mechanisms that are taking place in, in those diseases. Um, I think, well, it, it, because it's a, it's a very interesting question and, and it's a very difficult to answer because there are some papers and some groups who have been studied the participation of adult neurogenesis in forgetting in the opposite process that all of us have been studying, which is the, the incorporation or, or the generation of new, new memories. It's known or it has been suggested that new neurons are also important for forgetting. So regarding, for example, PTSD, what would we want more neurons? Would it be beneficial to forget the traumatic memories or would it be somehow uh, beneficial to keep those memories? So I think it's complicated to answer whether it would be good or bad. Um, I have another question and I apologize because it's going to sound very silly and I'm aware of that. But um, I mean, your studies are very clear and very solid in describing uh, with markers, with the use of markers, the existence, the structure and the positioning of the, of the cells. But you obviously cannot do functional studies. So everything is pointing to a good, a proper function of the, of the cells in the brain, but you're still lacking that other piece of information. And I know right now it's virtually impossible to approach these studies, but how, how do you see the future in that aspect? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. This, this is the main limitation of, of all post-mortem studies that you can, you have to limit yourself to observe what is happening, to observe the final picture that is printed in the, in the brain of, of those patients. There are some attempts or there, there have been some attempts to visualize markers or biomarkers of adult neurogenesis in vivo. And some strategies are, are being developed by different groups, uh, including functional magnetic spectroscopy or um, a positive uh, <laughs> emission uh, tomography. Um, which by now haven't developed a widely accepted indicator of adult neurogenesis. But I do envision that that has to be developed uh, if possible, because I think it would seem impossible for us to visualize a very small tumor uh, several years ago. And now we can even count the number of cells that it, this tumor has in vivo. So, I trust on those strategies, on the potential of those strategies to, to really visualize what is happening and to be able to correlate the functional uh, aspects of neurogenesis, which as far as we know, are related to the acquisition of new memories and to see those cells functioning, functioning in vivo. Of course, that would be uh, the dream for every researcher in this field. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't see more questions in the chat. And I think I'm gonna ask you the last one. And is, I mean, when I, when I define researchers, I tend to do like two categories, like in the soccer leagues, it's the first teams and then it's the rest of us. So I, I, I see you as a player in the main league and, and the, one of the difference between you and us is the kind of questions that you ask to yourselves. And I think you ask yourself like big questions, what I define as big questions in biology. So what is this next big questions that you're asking yourself? Well, first, let me say that I love the small questions. I think everyone should ask small and big questions. And I think that the league in which all of us play, I would say it's the same. Uh, circumstances are different for all of us during different periods of our career, but I consider all of us doing all the time big and small questions. 
one of our biggest questions is uh, to what extent the process of adult neurogenesis in humans is actually unique. So to what extent this process shares features between species and which are the things that are different. And the biggest question is why those things are, are different. But I don't consider, I mean, it's as big or as small as any other question that anyone can have. That's the one that interests uh, us now uh, the most. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Maria. It was, it was, well, thank you for your answers, specifically this one. And, and thank you again for accepting the, the invitation. It has been a, a fantastic lecture on neurobiology, and it has been a real pleasure to have you back at home, not physically, and we hope we can have you here soon probably to talk about your next science paper or nature medicine paper. So good luck with that. And I'm sure it will happen and we will invite you again. And well, thank you. And thank you all at home for participating in these events and for keeping this seminar series alive. And we will be back soon with more stuff. We will talk about farms. We will talk about all the things that are in the media and are related to biology. And we hope to see you there. Thank you, Maria. And thank you thank all. You and please much. take care. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. <laughs>